Good morning and welcome. Today we'll be talking about chapter 26 from AMSCO AP US History. Uh, chapter 26 is on Truman and the Cold War, 1945 to 1952. Um, so looking at the changing world after World War II, the changing role of America, um, focusing on both domestic policies, how, uh, world, <coughs> how the US is adjusting and adapting after World War II, and then also um, some foreign policies and, and the US is kind of first forays into Cold War conflict, specifically in the Korean War. Um, you can see how I've got my note taker set up here. So looking at the context, domestic changes, the Cold War, both causes and the approach of the US, um, the Korean War, and then the Red Scare to wrap us up. Um, so first looking at, at, at uh, post-war America. Um, Remember, leading up to World War II, the U.S. had been an isolationist nation. They had been, uh, uh, now they fought in World War I for about a year and a half, but they were isolationists before that. They were isolationists in the 1920s and 1930s, especially during the Great Depression. Um, and as World War II began, the U.S. was, was kind of slowly sucked in to support the Allies, Cash and Carry Act, Land Lease Act, things like that. Um, by the time World War II is finally over, um, the role of the U.S. in the world has completely changed. They are no longer an isolationist nation. They are now a military superpower and a world leader. And it's truly their role in World War II that transforms their role in the world. Um, so again, before World War II, the U.S. was an isolationist nation with perhaps a brief foray into World War I. After World War II, they are a world leader, the leader of NATO, one of the leaders of the United Nations, and a military superpower. Seeing this map here of the two superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union, with perhaps some of their allies. Um, world War II is going to be a, a monumental event in shaping the next 15, 20 years of America. Um, we have uh, 15 million Americans fight in the war and they're returning home to an America that is changing. But this time period immediately after World War II is w one of the, the most prosperous periods in US history. Um, it has the highest standard of living ever, um, at least at that time. So, so we'll say context here, World War II turned the US from an isolationist to a military superpower and a world leader. And I'm gonna put this second bullet point under domestic changes here. Uh, well, so the 1950s is the highest standard of living. There's economic growth. And so that's gonna to lead to all sorts of, of domestic changes. Oops, whoopsies. Um, that's gonna to lead to, to all sorts of domestic changes as um, the soldiers returning home are able to get a job are able to buy a house, are able to, to get an education. And much of that was through a US policy called the GI Bill. Um, the GI Bill basically provided a free college education for those returning World War II veterans and also gave them the opportunity to buy a house um, with a, a relatively low interest uh, home loan. Um, the GI Bill was basically the US government's way to pay back the soldiers for making the ultimate sacrifice. Well, I suppose they didn't make the ultimate sacrifice because they came back alive. Um, but kind of following in the vein of the New Deal, uh, the US using federal spending, government spending to stimulate the economy, and it works. Um, uh, the US economy was already doing well during World War II. World War II is really what got the US out of the Great Depression. Um, and the GI Bill, um, is one of the things that allows that growth to continue and really leads to, to, to an explosion of economic growth. Um, so we'll say the GI Bill uh, provides free college um, and home loans to World War II veterans. Whoops. And I'll say that this uh, stimulates a post-war economic boom. Um, the other boom that there was was a baby boom, uh, a huge increase in births, uh, especially immediately after the war. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to try to figure out why there'd be a lot of births in the few years after the war, um, soldiers returning home to their sweethearts or returning home from, from fighting for, for, for a long time. They're eager to get a life started. They're eager to have children. 
Um, and so this, this uh, red period from 1945 to 1960 shows the increase in the birth rate, a huge uptick right when the war is over, and then kind of a steady plateau for the next 10, 15 years of increased birth rates. Uh, my parents are both part of that generation. My dad, 1950, my mom, 1952. Um, again, sometimes it's called the, the boomer generation. Um, and this increase in, in the US population uh, also leads to the growth of suburbs and to the growth of a region of America called the Sun Belt, which is like the Southern US, Florida to US, uh, sorry, to US, Florida to California, whoops. Um, and so it begins to change the uh, demographics of America. So we got baby boom, 1945 to 1960. Uh, so it leads to a growth of suburbs and the Sun Belt. For example, people moving to California, Arizona, Texas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then looking at some domestic policies, um, Harry Truman, uh, a Democrat, Harry Truman became president in 1945 after FDR's death. Um, FDR died just a few months uh, before World War II was over. Um, Harry Truman was a uh, Democrat, but a much more moderate Democrat than FDR ever was. FDR was pretty progressive, pretty, pretty extreme for his time. Think about all of his government spending with the New Deal. Um, and, and Truman still continued some of that government spending, the idea that the government should spend money to put people to work, to um, help people out, but in a much more moderate fashion. 1946, he creates the Employment Act to put people to work. Um, and he also, um, Truman is oftentimes known as, as the first modern president to uh, kind of tackle a racial discrimination head on. Um, he desegregated the armed forces, desegregated uh, uh, the workforce in the federal government. He strengthened the civil rights division of the Justice Department so, the ju that, so that the Justice Department can now track down and enforce their uh, uh, civil rights policies. Um, but he was unable to, to pass really strong laws with teeth that prevented uh, discrimination in, in hiring for jobs. And that was um, probably largely because um, even though Truman was a Democrat and he was in the White House, the Republicans controlled Congress. Um, and the Republicans uh, basically sought to block any and all of his domestic policies. Um, they also weakened the power of unions. They uh, passed an amendment or helped pass an amendment that put a two term limit for presidents. FDR had served four terms or three terms in a few months. Um, and so Truman is, is uh, uh, an important president because he continues FDR's legacy of using the federal government to help people. And he also tackles racial discrimination head on. Uh, but he's not as effective as he could have been partially because he didn't, his party didn't control Congress and he wasn't able to pass as, much, as many um, uh, anti-discrimination laws. So we'll say President Truman um, challenges racial discrimination. So we'll say that he uh, desegregates the federal government and the army, but we'll say Congress blocks uh, most of his uh, proposals kind of limits how much control he can have. All right, we're gonna talk much more about the civil rights era in a couple of weeks. And so um, that's just kind of a teaser of that. Some presidents starting to tackle civil rights, but maybe no major changes yet. Um, much of today is talking about the origins of the Cold War. Now, um, depending on uh, when you're watching this, if you're watching this in 2021, um, Last year, we didn't talk about the Cold War too much because of COVID. Uh, AP Euro never touched it. Uh, world history, we had a few lessons on it, um, but those were like those independent driven uh, lessons. And so um, the Cold War is a time period after World War II from 1945 to 1989 or so. It's um, basically a period of increased tension and competition between the, two, the world's two superpowers. Uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union or communist Russia. Um, it was called the Cold War because the U.S. and the Soviet Union never directly went to war. They never directly attacked 
each other. But there was an arms race as they built up huge stockpiles of nuclear weapons. There was a competition for allies as they tried to get as many people on their side, the US allying mostly with uh, Western Europe and the Americas, the Soviet Union allying mostly with Eastern Europe and some Asian countries. And then they also fought proxy wars throughout the world, which meant that the US would support uh, uh, democratic forces in Vietnam and Korea. And then the Soviet Union would, would support communist forces in Korea and Vietnam and other places. And so even though the US and the Soviet Union never directly fought against each other during the Cold War, um, they are fighting for 45 years. They're just fighting over control of Vietnam or over control of Cuba or over control of a whole host of other countries. So we do need a definition here of the Cold War. Um, this is uh, 1945 to 1989, let's say. And it's a period of increased tensions and competition between the US and the USSR. And when you look at why the Cold War started, um, you gotta go to World War II. Now, you might remember the US and the Soviet Union were allies during World War II. They both fought against the Nazis, uh, but they were all, always uneasy allies. They never fully trusted each other. Um, they had a common enemy, Nazi Germany. So, you know, the whole adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay, they were kind of allies. And they also cooperated a little bit after the war was over. They, they uh, helped to found the United Nations together. Both of them got a permanent seat on the Security Council. They both uh, uh, worked together during the Nuremberg trials to put Nazi uh, uh, war leaders on trial. And so, there was the potential for the US and the Soviet Union to maintain a, a friendly uh, uh, alliance or friendly agreement. But in the last year of World War II and as the war ended, um, the cracks in their alliance began to show. Um, first, um, the Soviets had to fight Nazi Germany basically by themselves. Uh, the US, uh, really got into the, the, the European war of World War II on D-Day, June 6, 1944. But that meant that for about two and a half years, 1941 to 44, the Soviet Union was fighting Nazi Germany by themselves. They felt abandoned. And so the Soviets began to think, why should we ally with the US if they didn't even help us during World War II? And then once the war was over, um, that tension was ratcheted up tenfold. Um, Part of the uh, uh, post-war agreements after World War II was that all of the, the Eastern European nations that, that Nazi Germany had conquered, the, the, the decision was they're all gonna have free elections and they can decide what to do. If they wanna elect a democratic leader, if they wanna elect a communist leader, whatever, they'll get to decide. The Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin said, yeah, sure, we'll do that. But then they totally rigged the elections. They made it so that only communists could run. They imprisoned uh, uh, people from the uh, opposition political parties. They distributed propaganda. And the Soviet Union basically took control of Eastern Europe. I'm talking uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, et cetera. Basically, the Soviet Union took control of those countries as their own satellite states. Um, so as we're looking at the causes of the Cold War here, um, the US and the USSR um, were allies during World War II, um, but the USSR kind of felt abandoned by the US um, during the war. And so after the war, um, the USSR rigged elections and basically took control of Eastern Europe. And so that uneasy alliance between these two countries is basically gone by 1950 or so, uh, or really by 1946 or 1948, let's be honest. Um, and so Winston Churchill, the prime minister of England famously said an iron curtain has descended across the continent saying that a, a, a metaphorical curtain is separating the free world, Western Europe, democratic countries and the communist world, Soviet Union, Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this was most notable in Germany. Uh, Germany was, was partitioned into zones of occupation after World War II, which meant that basically they were split up into four pieces. 
really they were split up into two pieces. West Germany was controlled by the US, England, and France. The US, England, and France helped to build West up, helped, helped to build West Germany up to become an economic powerhouse and a, uh, a beacon of freedom in Europe. And then the Soviet Union controlled East Germany and they turned it into a totalitarian piece of their, of their uh, communist Soviet empire. Um, and so when we're talking about Germany, Germany was partitioned into zones of occupation after World War II. The US controls West Germany and they help them to rebuild. The US control, sorry, the USSR controls East Germany and basically makes it uh, part of their empire. And so that, that idea, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent is the idea that there is a clear dividing line between West and East, between free and Soviet. And so as the Cold War begins, again, 1945 to 1989, um, the US approach became a need to contain communism, to limit the spread of communism. Um, a few key terms here, it's gonna be uh, five kind of important key terms here. Uh, first is the domino theory. Uh, the domino theory was the theory that if one country falls to communism, then all nearby, uh, then all nearby countries will fall as well. And so there was a need to limit the spread of communism. This was called containment. This was the US goal to to limit the spread of communism. And containment is really the, the policy that, that explains what the US does for the next 40 years. The reason why the US gets involved in the Vietnam War is to contain the spread of communism, to keep it from spreading too far. It's gonna justify US military intervention all the way through the 80s. And so a few specific policies here. Um, that kind of fall under the umbrella of containment. Uh, first is the Truman Doctrine, uh, created by President Harry Truman. And it basically said that if there are any uh, civil wars where, where free peoples are fighting against a totalitarian regime, the US will support them. So the US will support uh, free peoples fighting against totalitarianism. Now, what's that support going to look like? Well, it's going to look like troops. It's going to look like money. Um, the Marshall Plan was the next big US policy uh, uh, nicknamed uh, because of George Marshall, the Secretary of State. I think his first name is George. Um, the Marshall Plan says, OK, not only is the US going to help free peoples who are fighting against totalitarianism, the US will also support, or sorry, uh, uh, will also, um, sorry, the US uh, helps Western Europe to rebuild after World War II. Western Europe becomes an incredibly prosperous part of the world. They're doing incredibly well, um, especially compared to Eastern Europe, which is struggling under the, the control of the Soviet Union. And if you think about communism, when is communism most popular? Well, who is communism most popular to? It's most popular for the workers, because communism is all about the workers rising up and uh, claiming the means of production. And so if, if a country is doing well, if there's jobs, if the workers are happy, then communism is not really gonna happen. Um, and so the Marshall Plan is, is the US's idea of, let's help our allies have strong, healthy, prosperous economies, and then they'll never turn to communism. One way I oftentimes think about this, uh, the Truman Doctrine, Truman Troops, it's all about sending troops to fight communism. The Marshall Plan, Marshall Money, all about sending money to help countries stay strong so they don't become communist. And then the last uh, uh, key term is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, which was a military alliance between the US, Canada, and Western Europe. Uh, let me zoom out here so we can see all of our allies. Yeah, the US, Canada, and then most of Western Europe. Um, this was a military alliance that promised mutual defense, which means uh, an attack on one is considered an attack on all, and all will provide defense. 
Uh, that mutual defense uh, provision of NATO has only been, been used one time in its history, and that was 9-11. Um, and so when President Trump was uh, president, he oftentimes criticized NATO as saying that the European countries didn't pay their fair share, the U.S. was paying too much in it. Okay, sure, maybe, I don't know. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when the U.S. was attacked on 9-11, our European allies defended us. Um, and this was an alliance created to, to fight against or to combat the spread of communism. So again, the, the, this US approach of trying to contain the spread of communism by sending troops, by sending money, by having a military alliance um, was put to the test very early on in the Korean War, 1950 uh, to 1953, essentially. Um, very long story short, uh, let, me, let me zoom out here so we can see the map better. Uh, China becomes communist in 1949 um, under Mao Zedong. And after China becomes communist in 1949, that domino theory kicks in. Well, 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 crap. If China's communist, then communism is going to spread to Korea. Communism is going to spread to Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, which we'll get to in the Vietnam War in, in a week or two. Um, and that's exactly what happens. Um, Korea, Korea had been a Japanese colony, but after Japan was defeated in World War II, uh, Korea was partitioned, just like Germany, into two zones. North Korea is controlled essentially by the Soviet Union and they're communist. And South Korea is controlled essentially by the US and they are not fully democratic, but pro US interest. They actually had a dictator. Um, now, the Soviet Union and, and China specifically, China wasn't happy with having a pro US force right next to them. So, with China's support and with the Soviet Union support, North Korea invades South Korea to try to make the whole peninsula communist. The UN, mostly the US, almost exclusively the US, sends troops to support South Korea. And so when we're talking about the causes of the Korean War here, um, Korea was split into two after World War II. It was a communist North and basically a free South. That's kind of simplifying things. Um, and North Korea invades uh, South Korea in 1950 to spread communism. Again, the fear for the US here is the domino theory, the spread of communism. And so why does the US get involved? What policy is that? Well, they're following containment to limit the spread of communism. They're following the Truman Doctrine to send troops to support free peoples fighting against totalitarianism. Um, and the, the Korean War, this, this first real uh, uh, conflict between uh, the U.S. and communist forces, um, ends in a stalemate. It ends with an armistice, an agreement to stop fighting, and it ends with a divided Korea along the 38th parallel. Basically, the exact same line where they were divided um, a few years earlier before the war started. North Korea remains communist. They're still communist to this day. South Korea remains free. South Korea is one of the most prosperous uh, countries in the world today. Uh, they, they, I mean, uh, uh, companies like, like Samsung and Nokia are based in South Korea. Um, but with two and a half million killed, 54,000 Americans killed in this first conflict of the US fighting halfway around the world to try to spread, uh, contain the spread of communism. And so the Korean War, oftentimes forgotten in US history because it did end in a stalemate and because it only lasted for three years and because it's oftentimes overshadowed by, by the much more uh, deadly Vietnam War a few years later. Um, did the Korean War work? Technically, technically it contained communism. It prevented communism from spreading to South Korea. But in the eyes of many Americans, especially in the eyes of Republicans who were, were criticizing President Truman, in the eyes of many Americans, it was considered a failure because we didn't defeat the uh, communist North Koreans. And it kind of showed that maybe the US was being soft on communism. Um, so it ends with an armistice and a divided Korea. And so the question again is, was the Korean War a success? 
I'm going to leave that as an open-ended question. Yes, we contained the spread of communism, but we didn't win the war. Um, now, most Americans are still very patriotic. It's only been seven years since World War II, um, but we are starting to see some of those um, um, political disagreements between Democrats and Republicans over fighting these wars. The last thing to talk about um, with President Truman and kind of the, the, the immediate years after World War II is the second Red Scare. The first Red Scare was after World War I. Um, after World War I, Russia had just turned communist and there was a fear that communism was spread, would spread. Um, after World War II, communism is spreading like a wildfire. And so there's even more of a fear that communism might spread to America. And so the Red Scare is a, a paranoia among Americans that communism will spread to their country, that communism will take root in America. And so in response, Congress passed laws making it illegal to support any totalitarian government. And they even created detention camps um, for subversives, for traitors. Um, the House of Representatives created the, the HUAC, the House of Un-American Activities Committee, that basically looked for and investigated suspected communists in Hollywood, in the Boy Scouts, among teachers. Um, and many of these suspected trade uh, communists some of them might have been communists, some of them weren't. Um, they would oftentimes be charged with the crime. They would oftentimes be forced to take a loyalty oath, an oath of allegiance. And they would oftentimes be blacklisted, which means they would never be able to be hired again because they had the scarlet letter, the stain of being a communist. Now, some of them were communists, some of them were not. But this was a direct violation of the First Amendment, of our freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, and so there was this fascinating uh, cultural debate as to whether you could be a communist in America. Um, the communists were America's enemy in the Soviet Union and in China. And so if you're, if, if you're a communist, are you supporting the enemy? But at the same time, in the US, the First Amendment gives us the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression. Um, and this went directly against that. Uh, most famously, Joseph McCarthy, this whole era sometimes called McCarthyism because of him. He was a Republican senator from Wisconsin, um, and he used his bully pulpit as a senator to uh, launch uh, baseless, factless accusations against hundreds of federal government employees. He famously said that 205 communists worked in the State Department. He had names um, and would basically accuse whoever he wanted to with no evidence. For a short time period, the early 1950s, McCarthy uh, held a huge influence over the Senate and was the leader of this, this, this crusade, this witch hunt against communists. Ultimately, he stepped too far. He was too ruthless. He was seen as a bully. He was censured by Senate, which means like publicly condemned. And he died just a few years later, um, most likely of alcoholism. Um, just kind of a, a ruined career and a ruined man. Um, and so when we're talking about the, the Red Scare here, whoops, the spread of communism leads to paranoia in America of basically will America become communist? There's a fear of that. And so the, the HUAC, House of Un-American Activities uh, Committee, uh, investigates suspected communists in Hollywood, in the Boy Scouts and teachers. And then Joseph McCarthy's, again, this whole era is called Joseph McCarthy, um, accuses uh, government officials of being communist. Eventually this era will fizzle out, but again, it, it really helps to capture the paranoia and the fear that Americans had. And it really shows that this fear of communism gripped the entire country. These photographs, uh, the red menace, communism coming to take over America, and then Joseph McCarthy, um, happily, posing with this this newspaper that calls him treason to America, uh, but he thought he was doing the right thing, obviously. And so, as we pause here, um, we can get just about everything. Let's zoom out just slightly. We can get it all on one page. Um, this time period, 1945 to 1952, transforms America into a world leader. Uh, domestically, uh, 
they are in the middle of a post-war economic boom. And then in terms of foreign policy, they're getting sucked into the Cold War. I don't know if they're getting sucked into. They're choosing to get involved in the Cold War, fighting in Korea to contain the spread of communism, which also creates a paranoia of, of the spread of communism in America as well. Uh, we'll continue the story next chapter with the uh, Vietnam War and the continued um, um, intervention of America abroad to try to contain the spread of communism.